Nigel Farage has written to every Conservative councillor facing re-election, encouraging them to defect to Reform UK. He's called the offer a lifeline for councillors who could risk losing their seat to his party. Deputy Leader of Reform UK, Richard Tice, joins me live now. Richard, good afternoon. First of all, let Very me ask you, to you, why would... It's working already, Ben. It's already working. <laughs> it's amazing. How many? It's fantastic. Give me numbers. How um, many? We've, we've got people from Essex to Scotland to the Midlands... Some have come over today, some are coming over in the next few days, because you've just uh, highlighted the key word, which is lifeline. And these are great people who are real conservatives, who feel they've been completely and utterly abandoned by the wet, woke, one nation bunch that is, uh, that is really the sort of the the mainstream of, of the uh, Conservative Party. But Richard, if you listen to and Robert so Jenrick, he's, he's sorting that out. He's, he's pledging to leave the HR. He's even talking about mass deportations, which you guys uh, seemingly are afraid to do. So uh, the, the question begs, if the Tories are sorting themselves out, as Robert Jenrick pledges to do, and if he is elected leader on November the 2nd, I think it is, why would they bother going to reform? Well, if you follow the betting markets, he's not got a... Uh a scooby-doo of a chance. And look, you can't out-farage-farage. Farage. That is the key point. And I think people have realised that you just can't trust the Tory leadership. They say one thing and then actually consistently over years and years, election after election, have done just exactly the opposite. So up and down the country, councillors are looking over their shoulder and they're saying, actually, I'm a real Conservative. I agree with reform policies. It's time for me to show some courage and move on over. And this is a precursor to the May elections next year, when we're going to be standing in thousands of seats across England. And we've got a cracking chance. I think we're going to win hundreds and hundreds of council seats. And it's a it's okay. just another significant step in the uh, in, in the sort of growing momentum that reform has. Richard, how are you going to, to be quite frank, how are you going to ensure that lots of these, these councillors and lower level politicians aren't just, uh, as we saw in the UKIP days, there were handfuls of them, just a bunch of nutters who would cause you uh, a lot of problems? Ben, you're seriously not calling Conservative councillors a bunch of nutters, are you? I mean, the Conservatives well, are better there, there, were, there were some back fine. in the day, there were some moving to UKIP back in the day, well, not listen, just from Tories, uh, but it, it, we're talking about vetting. Uh, of course, uh, we recheck and revet and vetting is something which is it's like an mot it's valid at the point you vet and uh, then obviously people are going to continue to behave so uh, you know but people understand that it's very important to uh, you know to be uh, behaving and using social media in a in a sensible and proper way OK, Richard, um, uh, you're, you're obviously you're a new MP. You've been in and around Parliament and the Commons for a couple of months now. Let me get your thoughts on this uh, interaction from Kim Johnson MP and Diane Abbott about Chris Cabber yesterday. Take a look at this. I'd also like to send my condolences to the family, friends and loved ones of Chris Caber, particularly this week while the media are using racist gang tropes to justify the killing of Chris Caber. Nothing could be more damaging for police-community relations than if the idea took hold the police were above the law. What do you make of your parliamentary colleagues, uh, particularly saying uh, that the media were dishing out gang tropes about Chris Caber? Well, I was in the chamber at the time and I spoke immediately after those two honourable members and I expressed my clear support and that of Reform UK for the brave frontline police officers and Martin Blake, the sergeant, and his family. That's uh, our clear point. And I asked the Home Secretary, does she still have confidence in the Independent Office for Police Conduct and the Crown Prosecution Service, given that even the jury wrote a letter to the judge they wanted read out, but the judge ridiculously refused, expressing astonishment as to why this case got to court. They dismissed it, quite rightly, in three hours. And we, the public, Ben, have been completely gaslit. If we had been told the truth, as opposed to having a cover-up about the violent, gun-toting, stabbing, fearsome gangster that Mr. Cabba was, if we were told that early doors, you wouldn't have had the community attentions, you wouldn't have had the protests. Yeah, but Richard, and 
you wouldn't have had that ill feeling. And that's really important. And we have to learn the lessons from this. But Richard, that, that's how we do it in this country with criminal trials. Yeah, you have a, you I, have no, a jury no, of 12 no, that can't I, be influenced I, I, by I'm previous sorry. criminal history. I don't accept that. We have to learn the lessons. If we don't learn, we will continue to have misinformed, violent protests when actually the truth is very different. So we have to learn the lessons and be prepared to change things. We don't always know best in this country. But Richard, is, 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 is the truth having any effects? Because we know the truth now about Chris Cabber's history. He was a, gang, a gun-toting gangster. And we should have and, known and that yet, day one. And yet, Richard, we've had people... we would be in a very different place. But we've had, we've had MPs, the clip I just showed you, Rachel, uh, Kim Johnson, Diane Abbott, uh, other people on like, the, the Chatterati online, still defending him, even in light of the facts and, of his, uh, his crimes. And they look completely and utterly ridiculous, don't they? Because tens of millions of British people support the brave firearms officers. Uh, and the, the reality is that we now see from the video evidence and from the computer evidence that Mr. Cabot was, he was putting those police officers, trying to arrest him, in serious grave danger, attacking them, ramming them with his car, trying to evade arrest. And he was in a car that was involved in a firearm incident the night before. Yeah, OK, I, I, just, I just can't accept the argument that we need to know about his previous criminal, or jury anyway, needs to know about his previous criminal past. Of course that's well, going to influence gonna, someone's can, decision. We can agree to disagree, but <laughs> unless you're basically saying you're going to cover up the truth, you're going to misinform the public, and therefore you could potentially have a police officer charged uh, with murder and all that that entails, he's got a price on his head, yeah. I think we need to learn some lessons and I think we have to be prepared to do better and show continuous improvement. Yeah, I think it's outrageous that uh, that firearms officer was named. I think it's ridiculous. As you said, there's a 10K bounty on his head. Uh, anyway, lastly, uh, Richard, um, unfortunately, we've revealed today on this channel that migrant crossings uh, across the English Channel are about to surpass last year's total. So last year there were 29,437 crossings in the next, I'd say, in the next... 24 hours, we're going to surpass that. What's your reaction to that? Well, look, I mean, sadly, these crossings will continue and the deaths will continue. This is a, uh, tragically, a record year for deaths. Babies, children, women are dying crossing the channel because our current prime minister, like the previous prime minister, hasn't got the guts and the leadership and the courage to do what he's in, allowed to do under international maritime law, which is to pick up and take back. The moment we do that, this whole thing stops within two or three weeks, and that's the only moment at which these deaths will stop. And we've our, our Reform UK policy is the kind and compassionate policy that will stop this disaster. Uh, what about smashing the gangs, Richard? How's that going? Well, I keep asking the Home Secretary how long she's going to try her policy of smashing the gangs uh, before she gives up and accepts the Reform UK policy is the only valid policy that will work. She refuses to answer the question. And, and that's because the truth is, she's got no idea. I mean, whether it's six months, 12 months, at some point, they're going to have to capitulate, they're going to have to stop the deaths and pick up and take back. And actually, of course, France have a legal obligation to do that under international maritime law, which they're in breach of. So you, you, you keep mentioning this uh, maritime law. What is it? The U UN Convention on Laws it's, of the Seas? How would reform do it? What is it? It's the 1982 UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, as well as the 1974 Safety of Life at Sea Act. I've read both of those treaties. Pretty dry old read, but I know the exact clauses under which we've got the ability and the uh, the legal right to do that. And frankly, if we were running a show, that's what would happen. OK, and just finally, in a word or two, Richard, who would you rather see, who would reform rather see win the Tory leadership race? Uh, Kemi Badenoch or Robert Jenrick? I don't care. I don't think either of them will be their leader at the time of the next general election. All right, I thought you'd say that. Richard Tice, Deputy Leader of Reform UK, thank you for your company this evening.